And we're, yeah. guys, we're just getting some significant news in reports that Nikki Haley has called for a news conference at oh. 10 o'clock Eastern time this morning. Some reports that she may suspend her campaign. We haven't confirmed that yet at NBC News, but she will speak at 10 o'clock this morning. The expectation may be uh, that she's moving on now from this campaign. Exiting the race. Yeah. Mm. John's jump ball, go. Okay. I'll go first. Uh, on, on, uh, <laughs> nice. It's rare to be hollering yeah. to the punch, right? It's rare to be hollering. Like, Ramirez like the Hobson of uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just Shut eagerly, up. Like, well, I know. eagerly moving into If, he, if he got the ball first, I would never get it back. <laughs> that's, the, that's the lesson that I've learned here. Uh, first, yeah. first on, uh, on. Instead on, of the Hobson, we'll call you the Kobe. <laughs> the, if, well, you, you I don't like that. But yeah. the, uh, on, on Haley, yes, and the Wall Street Journal is reporting that she will not immediately endorse Donald Trump. So we will see if that changes in the days and weeks ahead. But yeah. she certainly, look, she did put up a win last night. She won Vermont. She won the District of Columbia over the weekend. But she also sort of gave voice to this, this part of the Republican Party that simply doesn't want to go back to the chaos of Donald Trump, that sees that as an electoral loser. And Haley, night after night, would point to polls and suggest she would beat President Biden somewhat handily yeah. in a November race, right. at least in a snapshot of polling we see today. That's simply not the case for Trump, where that's a fit much, much closer race. Uh, and I think that she to her credit, stayed in this race and gave also a voice to these criticisms of Trump to audiences that otherwise wouldn't hear them. And I think we're seeing that reflected in some of these Republican primaries who heard Haley on Fox News, who heard Haley in conservative media, and who realized that they simply don't want to go down that path again. This was inevitable. This is Trump's party still. The GOP is not ready to turn the page on Trump just yet. But Haley did her role in exposing some of those weaknesses that Trump will have to address before November. And we can confirm now at NBC mm -hmm. News, Nikki Haley will drop out as a race during those remarks at 10 o'clock Eastern. Uh Willie, um, you know, despite the fact that Donald Trump is doing uh, very well last night and, and his uh, his side of, of, of the ring, uh, a side that's lost seven years in a row and is sure to lose again this year if Democrats work hard and independents work hard, he kept trashing America. Like, that's Donald Trump's message. You know, Ronald Reagan would talk about how we were a city shining brightly on the hill for all the world to see. Donald Trump's message is America sucks. It was America sucks before he got mm -hmm. elected. Carnage. It's America sucks now. He talked about American carnage even after he got elected. He lied about an illegal invasion when Barack Obama and Joe Biden had rates at 50-year lows when he was going in in January of 2017 for illegal border crossings. But last night, over and over again, we're a third world country. Yep. Oh, are we really? Oh, I didn't know that third world countries had unemployment, unemployment below 4% two years running for the first time since the 1960s. Inflation down to 3.1%, historically low. You look at our GDP, compare that to the rest of the world. <laughs> Not third world. First world, we're doing better than all of our friends. We're doing better than all of our allies. We're doing better than all of our people who consider themselves to be America's enemies. Our economy is stronger than ever relative to the rest of the world. Our military is stronger than ever relative to the rest of the world. Culturally, we are stronger than ever relative to the rest of the world. And I'm not being flip when I say, look at Taylor Swift in Australia. Look at the clothes that people are wearing in China. Look at the fashions people are wearing across. The United States, more powerful culturally, more powerful economically, more powerful militarily uh, than ever before. And I, I don't know. I'm an American, so I'm kind of proud of that. And we fret about a movement that is based on the proposition that the United States of America sucks. That is Donald Trump's message. No, that is, something that is about. Donald Trump's message. And I will say, if Fox News goes around talking about how America sucks or Newsmax talks about America sucks. They're liars. They are liars. They will find a trans athlete that competed in a race two years ago, run it all day, and forget to tell everybody that jobless rates are lower now. Or that Donald Trump is any in time, indicted. <laughs> any time since the 1960s. Or they won't talk about the survey. So they'll say, oh, oh my God. They let somebody read a poem on a ship. We're too woke to fight a war. And then they will ignore one study after another study after another, another study that shows, let me say it again, the United States militarily 
far from being woke and weak, more powerful relative to the rest of the world's militaries than any time since 1945. That's a crazy thing. Donald Trump's campaign is based on so many lies. That to me, the most offensive is that we're a third world country, that our economy sucks, that our military sucks, that our democracy sucks, when in fact, just the opposite is true. We are the greatest in the world. I'm proud to be an American. This is, this is the greatest country in the world. And yet Donald Trump wins votes. What's wrong with you people? Why do you hate America? Why do you vote for a guy that says America is terrible? That it's a third world country? When really, all the evidence is, is, is to the contrary. This is why they lose every year, because they run campaigns dedicated to trashing the greatest country on the face of the earth. And that was exactly to your point, his speech last night, his victory <laughs> speech, which he looked exhausted, by the way. I don't know what's oh, going on. He, I, I, I feel he, sorry for kind him. Kind of muttering. He's just so beaten up. Muttering through a, a, a meandering speech. But that was exa yeah. you're exactly right. He talked about our economy being a disaster which is actually not true at all. Yes, inflation is too high. There's no question about that. It's ticking down, but still too high. But Joe just laid out every metric. Our economy is not, in fact, a disaster. He said, we stopped producing oil after I left office. We're producing more oil than we ever have in this country right now. Could you stop and say that again? Because I have Yahoo's come up oh. to me. Fox News says, Joe Biden not letting us drill. Okay, they don't talk that way. Maybe I'm projecting my voice onto these college. Well, I mean, like you and I said, you'll hear this for people with advanced degrees. Sure. And you go, no, actually, could you read the financial time? Fake news. Could you read the Wall Street Journal today? It will tell you America is drilling more oil today than ever before. And when it comes to natural gas, our biggest problem is we got too much. Yeah. We got a glut. Carnage. And when you hear it, he'll, he'll lay out all of Pure these. Pure carnage. He'll lay out all these lies in that room to applause and cheers. So it's resonant in some way. People who have access to the facts, who can easily know the truth, and maybe they do know the truth, and it's willful, cheering on these lies. Because but when it, did rooting they, against they, the United States become a punchline? I don't know. Well, yeah, it, it, Claire, there, but the truth is he has no rationale for his campaign unless there's a story that America sucks, which it does not. Not allergic to this big board, but what we see here, as you mentioned, Trump right now emerging from last night with 1,057 delegates, though we should note there are still some that have yet to be allocated in some of these states, so I think that number is going to rise a bit. It may, it may hit 1070, a little bit north of that, when all is counted, and that is significant on the Republican side because of this, the magic number of 1,215 delegates. That is what is needed to formally claim the Republican nomination. And again, if you were to add another dozen or so delegates, Delegates there to Trump's total. If you were to look at these results last night and then look ahead to next week, what states are voting next week? It is Georgia. It is Mississippi. It is Washington state. It is Hawaii caucus closed primary in two states in the South where we can show you here in a second. Donald Trump wasn't just winning last night in the South. He was winning by very, very large margins. Long way of saying between these four states next week and where the delegate total is likely to end up when everything is tallied from last night. Donald Trump is on track to have a very good shot of clearing that threshold one week from last night. On March 12th, we'll see if Nikki Haley is still in the race then, but that is now on the docket uh, potentially for next week. But looking at these results from last night, uh, you were talking early in the primary season, Nikki Haley, you, her, her line, you know, you heard was she was getting 43 in New Hampshire, 40 in South Carolina. She was calling it, quote, the 40 percent. She was saying that was 40 percent consistently in these primaries, not going for Donald Trump. Well, that number is not what we were seeing last night. It started in one of the states that if Haley were having a really good night last night. And I think if she were getting the kind of energy that she did have in New Hampshire and South Carolina, a state like Virginia would have been a ripe target for her. You know, you got big population dense northern Virginia, a lot of suburbs, a lot of voters with college degrees. These have been sort of her bread and butter. Uh, and take a look.
look here, she loses this thing by 28 points. Uh, that's a worse showing than she had in South Carolina, worse showing in New Hampshire, even though Virginia more demographically favorable to her than those states. You go south to North Carolina. I don't think a, a lot of folks, including the Haley folks, probably thought they were going to win North Carolina. But there's areas in North Carolina, the Triangle, the Charlotte area. There's, there's college areas where it looks ripe for her. And look at this. She's going to lose the state by more than 50 points last night. You see it in Tennessee last night. She doesn't crack 50. No surprise that she lost. To Alabama, but only with 13% of the vote. You go to Arkansas, she couldn't crack 20 there. And then I think the, the biggest noteworthy uh, state last night, just on this front, is Texas. I mean, look at this. She's going to lose it by 60 points. And again, we just talk about the areas Haley had been doing relatively well in early in southern New Hampshire, uh, in South Carolina. She won a congressional district in South Carolina. These, these suburban areas, you know, there's a lot of suburban areas around Austin, around Houston, the metro. Plex, Dallas, and a lot of suburban areas around the state that, again, on paper, you look at the demographics and you say, well, look, Haley may not win Texas, but she can start picking off some districts here. And, and I mean, just getting clobbered, Haley was, in these, you know, suburban areas. Take a look here, you know, Collin County, north of Dallas, she's losing it by 45 points, you know, 52 points. Take a look here. Uh, oh, let me zoom up. It's a little small one, but take a look here. This is one of the wealthiest counties in Texas. She's losing it by 57 points last night. So you, you add all all of this together, she did pick off a win late at night in Vermont. Um, you know, and we said we were going into this thinking if Haley had a shot anywhere, the probably Vermont was top of that list. She does yeah. get a narrow win. She does get the ability to say she won a state. But if you add up all the votes that were, I'll show you just California's results too. It's a closed primary, but under 20 percent there, and more votes to be counted. And I point that out because one thing we've been tracking is just what was the cumulative vote last night. If you added together all of the primaries, all the caucuses on the Republican side, uh, what share of the vote was Haley getting, given that she'd been using that 40 percent as, as sort of a, a talking point in the campaign trail? Currently, and again, with a lot of votes that are coming in California, she's running at uh, just under 24 percent. It's about 23, uh, excuse me, just uh, under 23 percent. It's 22.8 percent right now. And again, as those California results come in, if they keep up where they are, that number could fall earlier. So essentially, that 40 percent she's been talking about uh, on the campaign trail heading into last night, last night translated to just a tick over 20 percent for her. All right. Hey, NBC Steve Kornacki, thank you so thank much. You, Steve. God, greatly appreciate Thanks, Steve. it. You're the best. We, we have a terrier poodle coming <laughs> your way. Uh, as thanks from your friends yeah. at Morning Joe. I believe in my approach, but it's not what America wants right now. I love Arizona, and I am so proud of what we've delivered. Because I choose civility, understanding, listening, Working together to get stuff done. I will leave the Senate at the end of this year. All right, Independent Senator Kirsten Sinema of Arizona says she will not run for re-election this November. First elected in 2019 as a Democrat, she left the party and became an independent in 2022. She most recently served as one of the lead negotiators on the failed bipartisan border bill and appeared to be facing an uphill re-election battle. Democratic Congressman Ruben Gallego is running for her soon-to-be open Senate seat, along with Republican Carrie Lake, both praised cinema for her service to the state of Arizona. Claire. Well, here, listen, this is a woman who's going to have a very mixed legacy. Yeah. Really mixed. She did some things that, frankly, were real head-scratchers, mm -hmm. uh, particularly you know, the memorable moment where she kind of curtsied when she said no on minimum wage is something that really stuck in a lot of people's craw in terms of the Democratic Party. And also her, some of the stuff on some of the tax stuff was very bad, that she would stand up for carried interest. You know, that was crazy. I don't know what that was about. But I do think, it, as, as much as maybe some people listening don't want to hear this, she did do some of the hard work in terms of negotiating deals to get stuff across the finish line. Mm. And people who are willing to compromise and meet in the middle are in short, short supply in Washington. And I fear that after November, they're going to be in even shorter supply. Yeah. She worked harder at getting along with the Republicans than she did the Democrats because she wanted to make deals. She wanted to get things passed. And, you know, that's what she wants her legacy to be. 
I think, frankly, her legacy is going to be very mixed. mixed. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward, though. So you, I want your review about this. She's now who we got a, a contested uh, Senate seat there. Um, Carrie Lake, interestingly, uh, trying to move to the middle. She's kissing up to Cinema and trying to make friends with Meghan McCain, doing all that stuff. Is she, is, is she had a lot of problems, Kristen Cinema. But was she a better candidate than Gallego for against Carrie Lake in that in that race? Oh, uh, well, you know, first of all, I I, I don't think so. Right. I don't think so. I, I think the problem with the third party races is there's not enough. Yeah. of folks there to make it credible. She was going to have to get a pretty healthy percentage of Democratic votes mm -hmm. and an even healthier percentage of Republican votes mm -hmm. to win. Uh, I think it's a contrast, and I don't think Carrie Lake can clean up on aisle five. Uh, I think she's made such a mess in terms of how bad she has handled all the MAGA stuff and how much she's been just she keeps slavishly it. adoring Donald Trump. Weird. I, I, I think, I, I don't and it'll be interesting to see what cinema does in the race. I okay. predict she will not endorse Carrie Lake. <laughs> All right. Still um, we do have some breaking news this morning about Nikki Haley and her future in this race. Let's go live outside Nikki Haley's campaign headquarters on Daniel Island, South Carolina. That's where we find NBC News correspondent Ali Vitale. Ali, what's the latest there? Willie, it seems like it was just a few hours ago we left here wondering what would happen to Nikki Haley. And now, before the sun even came up over the Charleston area, it became clear to us through our sources that Haley today would not just be giving remarks around 10 o'clock in the building behind me, but that she would be exiting her race in those remarks. This is really one of those moments where we're getting answers to questions that we've been wondering for some time now. For instance, the role of Super Tuesday, and if that would be enough for Nikki Haley to finally say, that this was no longer going to be her race and that she was going to cede the space to former President Donald Trump. But in doing so and in continuing to be in this race, she has been very critical of Trump on everything from his mental fitness to his moral fiber on the world stage. Of course, you guys were just talking about some of the things that Trump has said. And I, I go back to a conversation I had yesterday with a Haley ally who said, Everything that the Clintons did to Trump in 2016 may have faded from the electorate's memory, but the Biden campaign is going to revive that and more. You have to imagine that one of the voices they're going to be using to make that case as they now pivot to a general election is Nikki Haley's because she has been clear and cogent in her criticisms of the former president. And that's not just coming from someone who was his active rival in the Republican primary. That's coming from someone who was his United Nations ambassador and worked in his administration. Administration. To that end, it's even more striking that we're told she's not going to endorse in these remarks coming up in just a few hours. It also makes sense, given the way that she made clear over the weekend that the RNC pledge is basically just a piece of paper. She had to sign it to get on a debate stage, but it's not enforceable. And certainly she is not going to be in a position of being forced into an endorsement, especially now as she leaves the race and basically says to Trump, the ball's in your court. Go ahead and win those voters back that I gained. All right. NBC's Ali Vitale, thank you very much. We a tragic thing happened during the election. It was a tragedy because you wouldn't have think of it. All of the problems that you have today, I don't think you would have had any of them. We're a third world country at our borders and we're a third world country at our elections. And we have to stop that. Our cities are choking to death. Our states are dying. And frankly, our country is dying. Our country is known as a joke. It's a joke. Other leaders who I speak to, other leaders can't believe what happened to us. Actually, other leaders across the world, I've spoken to quite a few, they only have ah, one worry about America, and it's that that guy becomes president again. Because, as you could tell, that guy lied time and time and time again. He can't help himself. Even his old fat Elvis, even exhausted even with his mind blinking, even with him not knowing what president he's running against, even with him not knowing who the Speaker of the House was on January the 6th, that guy still lost, lost and confused and lying. He said, our borders are chaotic. Why are our borders chaotic? Could it be, could it be that Donald Trump said, don't pass the largest, toughest border bill ever? 
that the people that are actually guarding the border were begging Republicans in the House to pass. And that Joe Biden offered to the Republicans that, yeah, well, that, bipartisan yeah. legislation. Exactly. And, and, and of course, you, you had a congressman from Oklahoma, one of the most conservative, actually uh, drafting that bill. I, so, yeah, if the borders are, are, are still in, in chaos, it's because of Donald Trump. Elections. He said the elections uh, were, you know, were, were rigged. Um, Sixty-three courts, federal courts, said Donald Trump was a liar. Donald Trump's own Supreme Court said Donald Trump was a liar. The three justices that he appointed said Donald Trump was a liar. The most conservative justices there said Donald Trump was a liar, that there was not widespread voter fraud. Every one of them said it, that Donald Trump was a liar, and yet... He just keeps lying. And, Willie, we've talked about the economy. You look at the economy. Oh, well, what about crime? Talks about crime. There are things we don't like about cities. We think, I think the Honest city troubles. council in Washington, D.C., the city council in, in New York City, the city councils on the West, they need to wake up. But the facts are the facts. Crime is near a 50-year low. Let me say that again. Crime in America is near a 50-year low. Unemployment is at a lower rate than it has been since the 1960s. These are 50-year lows for crime, 50-year highs for jobs, and yet the lies just continue. He hates on America when loving America would be easier. He hates on America when loving America would be telling the truth about America. The country has gotten so used to Donald Trump talking this way, but it's worth pulling back and considering the guy who wants to be president again, one of the last two standing now, says our country is a joke. Mm. He thinks the United States of America is a joke, and it's a joke based on all the lies that he laid out. We'll spare you from having to watch his low energy speech last night, but it was full of lies about the economy. It was full of lies about crime. It was full of lies about immigration in this country, but he has to paint this picture of a nation in decline, despite all the data that says otherwise, so that he can again ride in to rescue the country. The whole thing is based on a lie. I mean, who, who Mike Barnacle wants to vote for somebody that lies about their country and tears down their country? Why people, Seems I mean, to hate it. Ronald Reagan, again, he said America was a city shining brightly on the hill for all the world to see. FDR talked about optimism. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. John Kennedy, when deciding to go to the moon, he said, we decide to go to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. I mean, you go through America's history. It is positive. It is can do. It is keep your feet planted on the ground and keep reaching for the stars, <laughs> yeah. Casey Kasem. That is. <laughs> That's what the American spirit is about. It's what got the boys up the hill in Normandy on June the 6th, 1944. It's what helps us to continue to lead the world militarily, economically, technically, you name it. We lead it. And yet we got this guy lying to Americans, saying horrible things about their country, saying their country sucks. And then maybe they'll see something on Newsmax or OANNNNNN that says a trans athlete like three years ago in Boise uh, played basketball and knocked a girl down. Yeah. Something that, by the way, 95 percent of Americans go, no, we no, you, you, you know, don't, that, that shouldn't happen. You know, <clears throat> the clip that we played coming in of Donald Trump talking about the America that he knows, that he thinks he knows, uh, is stunningly pessimistic. And people thinking of running for or voting for president, any candidate, Trump or Biden, they want optimism. They want where are we going? They want sunshine. They want a belief that things are going to be okay in America, not what Donald Trump is selling. I think it's going to catch up to him in the long run. But the point that you just referenced, June 6, 1944, uh, I was reading again, rereading Rick Atkinson's trilogy, the first part yeah. of his trilogy on World War II, the Army at Dawn. And on the morning of June 6, 1944, a young lieutenant, James Rudder, from Texas, led the 2nd Airborne Battalion up the sides of a cliff called Pontu Hawk, a straight-up cliff 125 feet to a German pillbox. 
and he went right <coughs> at the Germans, right at the Germans. <coughs> 50% casualty rate. Why did they do it? They did it because we were Americans and we were there to save Europe from Hitler. And now all of these years later, we have to get together as a country and save the country from the threat that Donald Trump proposes. Do Donald Trump actually has said, we all know this, that he could solve the war in Ukraine in mm -hmm. one day. And we know how he would solve it. He would say, Vlad, it's yours he would turn it over to one of our fiercest enemies. That's what we have to watch out for. That's what we have to protect. We have to protect the country that we love, that we believe in, not the country that he describes so negatively, you're right, each and every day that he speaks about the country. Trashing the economy, insulting small business owners that wake up early in the morning, go to bed late at night, uh, trying to make their businesses work, trashing entrepreneurs, trashing the people that make our economy the strongest in the world, trashing Mika, and I know this is personal for you, I just for security reasons, I won't say who it is, but trashing people like one of your relatives mm. who could have done anything, could have gotten a job on Wall Street if you wanted to, could have gotten a job on Main Street if you wanted to, but decided to go into the United States Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. Decided decided to give, give everything he had to be a Marine. And we won't say where he is right now, but it ain't Miami Beach in spring break. And it's gonna be a long, tough haul for him. He did it voluntarily. That story is Many recounted Americans every day by thousands and thousands of young men and women. Yeah. Some coming from immigrant families, just like a lot of immigrants, uh, whether you're talking about World War II or whether you're talking about the Korea War or Vietnam, a lot of immigrants coming in and, 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 and deciding that they wanted to be a bigger part of this country. And Donald Trump insults our men and women in uniform every day, every single day. And I will say again, we know him. Yeah. But who in the audience continues to cheer as this man trashes mm -hmm are men and women in uniform. So th that is... You sit and watch cable news. Mm, yeah. These young men and women in uniform go through basic training. They kill themselves. They sacrifice their lives. They get assigned to go somewhere across the globe for three years. Mm -hmm. For three years, committed to one thing, Protecting and defending you, protecting and defending your rights, protecting and defending the United States of America. And you trash them? And you vote for a man who trashes them? That is just shameless. By the way, when he says I would, Trump says I would end the war in Ukraine tomorrow, that means he would cave to Vladimir yeah. Putin and give him whatever he wants. Exactly. That's, how, that's how he would end it. But to Claire's point, we're talking about cosmetics, and a lot of that's important. Is this guy too old? And look at the way he speaks. That's important. But listen to the substance of what they're saying. Listen to what Donald Trump was saying last night. It was lie after lie after lie about the economy. Everything he said about our economy was wrong whether it was employment data or oil production. That scares He's me. He's making up a story about this country so he can come in and ride to the rescue, a story mm -hmm. that's not true. He's talking about these secret flights of 300,000 migrants that have been dropped into the United States to raucous applause in the room. He's writing and telling a story that is not true. Listen to the substance. The cosmetics, the superficial part about Joe Biden, how he walks, all that stuff, that's interesting. And if you think that's important, that's up to you, but yeah. listen to what they're saying. Thank you. FDR ended the Depression, won a war against Nazism and Japanese imperialism. He didn't walk so well. So, I mean, again, you, you can focus on what you want to focus on, but, I mean, it's, it's really crazy. I will say, Mika, as Willie was saying, it, it, Trump lies. It's lie after lie after lie after lie that we really need more, more people on other networks and this yes. network, on every network, when Donald Trump starts doing that, to do what Neil Cavuto does. Mm -hmm. And he'll just pull out of, of, of a speech, say, listen, I have to tell you, 
He said the election was stolen. There's absolutely no evidence of that. 63 courts. And then he goes down the line. He said the economy is worse than it's ever been. None of the numbers show that. The economy is actually stronger than anywhere else in the world. That's what Neil does at 4 p.m. on Fox News. Uh, Steve Ducey does it. Uh, yeah. A good bit as well. Yeah. Uh, it, it, democracy depends on people at every network doing that. I know. The problem is there are more anchors and hosts who do the opposite and promulgate the lies. But you are right. It would help if a news host would deliver the news as fact. With uh, Nikki Haley exiting the race later this morning, the general election essentially starts today. Let's bring into the conversation Maryland's Democratic Governor Wes Moore. He's a member of the Biden-Harris campaign's National Advisory Board. Speaking of service, he also is a retired Army captain, combat veteran, the 82nd Airborne in Afghanistan. Governor Moore, always good to see you. Uh, so it does appear now that Nikki you. Haley at 10 o'clock this morning will drop out of the race, making this clearly now a Biden-Trump presidential run through November. What is the message this morning from the Biden campaign as you look to the general? I think the message is today only only finalizes uh, what the the campaign has known for a very long time is that this is a this is a very clear choice for for the people of our country where you know we have uh, we have a president who is leading us through very challenging times and actually delivering results versus the other person who's uh, the, the former president who's running simply for his own retribution. Uh, you know, that we have a, a campaign and a president that is focusing on making sure that he can en enhance opportunities and pathways and freedoms for people uh, around our country versus uh, versus Donald Trump, who is exclusively focusing on his own freedom and is going to spend the majority of the remainder of the year in courtrooms. And so I think this is a very clear choice. Uh, I think uh, today is just going to is just going to harden that fact. And that's why I think the campaign feels very good that uh, that the people are going to make the right decision come November. Governor Moore, one of the uh, constant criticisms that Donald Trump makes is that the government under Joe Biden, under the Democrats, does nothing to help people, that only he can turn around the country, that only he can help ordinary people. And yet in concert with the Biden administration, what has happened in Maryland? And could you please explain the Enough Act that you introduced last week? Yes. You know, I, I, I tell you, I, I, if he says that things aren't happening, uh, I can tell you he's got 6.2 million people in the state of Maryland who would contradict that. Uh, if you look at what's happening just in the state of Maryland, we've now, you know, since I've been governor, we've announced over 40,000 new jobs in the state of Maryland that we 40, have now uh, amongst the lowest... 40,000, amongst the lowest unemployment rate in the entire country for five straight months, that we have been able to see economic growth, uh, 20 points in economic momentum, which makes us one of the fastest growing economies uh, inside, of, inside, inside of this country. And we are taking a direct target on this issue of childhood poverty, and particularly generational childhood poverty. And that's what the Enough Act is. It's, a, it's an act that I personally introduced and testified on behalf of. And it really is the most direct and aggressive approach to addressing the issue of generational childhood poverty in our state's history, combining private, philanthropic, and also public dollars to be able to target it towards the issues that the community says are the ones that most need to be addressed. All that's happening, the momentum we're seeing right now in the state of Maryland, that's happening in partnership with the Biden administration. Everything from infrastructure jobs and, ele and, 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 bu and electric bus uh, fleet electrification. All these things are happening because we have the partner that we need in Washington. And so I can tell you, when, 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 uh, when Donald Trump can rant about things not going well, he has people all around the country who are seeing the impacts of a partnership, a, a healthy partnership between the federal government and state governments who will contradict that at every turn. Governor, I, I, I know you're not going to be surprised to know that I care deeply about the United States Senate and which party controls the majority in that body. Uh, obviously, uh, Governor Hogan getting into the race is a little bit of a wrinkle in terms of looking at Maryland as a safe spot for a Democrat to get elected to the Senate to take Ben Cardin's place. Can you handicap that race for us right now? And what do you see is going to be as de <laughs> determinative of the outcome? 
Yeah, I, I, I you know for 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 months, ever since uh, ever since his retirement, the uh, you know the old governor has been saying that the Senate is dysfunctional, that uh, they can't get anything done, that he would never want to be uh, arguing with 99 other people and not getting a single thing done. And then one day, uh, I guess Mitch McConnell's phone calls were very convincing to him and his whining and dining of, of, of Larry Hogan, and he decided to get inside the race. You know, one thing that we are we we know is that uh, is that if a vote. Uh, that we're going to see for any vote for for the old governor uh, is going to be a vote for the Republican Party. It's going to be a vote for Mitch McConnell and their ideals. Uh, I'm thankful for the fact that we have uh, very good candidates uh, on our side. I, you know, I personally supporting uh, Angela also Brooks uh, in the primary. Uh, but I know that uh, that our nominee is going to be in a very good position to be able to defend freedoms and making sure that we're doing things like re defending uh, reproductive health and a women's right to choose, uh, making sure that we're providing opportunities, economic opportunities, and particularly for communities that have been historically disenfranchised and historically left behind. These are all things that are on the ballot. And frankly, you know, uh, regardless of opinions on, on the old governor, these are not issues he's going to defend because he is going to caucus with the Republican Party. And that is something I think most Marylanders are going to understand and will end up voting with, uh, with our yeah. nominee. You know New York's first congressional district is becoming increasingly more important as Democrats look to take back control of the House this fall. Democratic congressional candidate John Avalon, a former anchor at CNN, is hoping to flip the Long Island swing seat currently held by Republican Nick LaLota. Congressman LaLota won the race in 2022 by 11 points just two years after President Biden managed to eke out a victory in the district by just 0.2 percentage points. And John Avalon joins us now. So why are you hey, running? Justin. I'm running because this is what I think we need to do. So this is a time for citizens to step up. Um, you know, as a journalist, I've always warned about dangers to democracy as writing you know, presidential histories. There are times where our country is in danger. And I think this is one of those times. And I didn't want to look my kids in the eye and tell them I could have done more when it mattered most. So time to get in the arena. So, John, uh, President Biden won by a very slim margin yes. in 2020 in that district. Nick LaLota, a couple of years later, won the Republican, won by 11 points. What are the trends in that yeah. district and what are people talking about as you go out and shake hands? Look, it, it, first of all, LaLota is the first one of those Republicans who represent a district that Biden won to endorse him. Right. So he's one of these like Trump flunkies, does whatever he says, far too far right for the district. He's a follower, not a leader. And I think that's out of step. Um, this is a swing seat. Um, that means there are a lot of you know, moderate Republicans, those folks who are voting for Nikki Haley this time around, who I think are persuadable. They're independent voters who I think you can win a majority over if you fire up the base. And I think this election is going to be a very different model than 22, for example, when Lee Zeldin, the former congressman who held the seat, was running uh, for governor. And that's one of the things that made that now. Is it immigration, election. John, the economy? It, it, what do you hear most? It, it, immigration and crime are issues for sure. Uh, we saw that in, in Tom Swasey's race in neighboring yeah. New York three. Uh, but but here's what, you know, uh, you know, as I knock on doors, it's petitioning time. And so I'm knocking on doors in, in Northport and, and Brookhaven. And I, I spoke to one woman uh, named Beverly. Uh, and what she said really stood out because it was both typical and distinct. First of all, I said to her, I said, you know, what, what's driving you this election? She said, Donald Trump. He's dangerous. We've got to stop him. He's a danger to our democracy. Then I said, what else? And she said the thing everybody else says, affordability. She said, I was just cut, you know, cutting coupons at my kitchen table to go to the grocery store later. But what she said was interesting. She said, you know, I'm frustrated. I don't know that it's just inflation anymore. Thinks, I think there's price gouging by, by, by companies. I don't know what it is. But I, I, that was an interesting sort of, you know, twist on, on what you hear as a constant complaint around housing, mm -hmm. health care costs. Affordability is the number one issue that people are feeling in Suffolk County. For so sure. as just mentioned, we just had a race in Long Island to replace the seat vacated yep. by George Santos. Tom Swasey, Democrat, won. One of the things he did was really blame Republicans for the, the downfall of the <clears throat> border security bill. Yep. I, I assume that's in your playbook as 100%. well. What other lessons did you learn from that race? Look, I actually want to hit, hammer that home because it speaks to the hypocrisy and the cowardice and the cynicism that we see. And Nick LaLota, uh, the current congressman from the district, is, implicit, is complicit in it. You know, if you're going to make people afraid of the migrant crisis, and it's a real issue, no question, right? Then you got an obligation to fix it. And Republicans got the, the border security bill they wanted. Democrats would rather have comprehensive immigration reform. We know that's how to solve the problem. But Republicans said, no, for Ukraine, Taiwan, and Israel funding, you got to do border security standalone. And then, of course, Donald Trump walked in and said, nope, 
Don't back this bipartisan bill. Toughest bill you'd ever see. Border Security Patrol wanted it. Nick LaLota tweeted. He mocked Senator James Lankford, the conservative Oklahoma senator, for doing this. He said, my nine-year-old could have done a better job negotiating bedtime than Lankford did on this bill. <laughs> and that's the kind of BS people are sick of. If you're going to inflame folks, if you're going to try to what, fear monger wait, wait, and fundraise... His nine-year-old could what he actually said. negotiate... A bill better than what Republicans say is the toughest border security. Maybe the nine-year-old should run because what <laughs> yeah. Langford did was nothing short of extraordinary. Yeah. And so, look, and, and this, what really infuriates folks is that they're not even putting up for a, a vote because they know it would pass. But when Lolota mocked it, yeah. I'm sorry, if you're going to fearmonger and fundraise off a problem and refuse to fix it, that's a firing offense. Yeah. yeah. Mike, so, so irresponsible. John, you've only been out there now, what, a couple of weeks? Two weeks. Two weeks. And what do you hear in the, across the two weeks going door to door and walking around the mm -hmm. district about the two G's, the grocery store and the gas station mm -hmm. that pay an important part in people's lives, added to the kitchen table where they sit down and write checks to pay off their credit card interest rates? Mm -hmm. What do you hear about those? And that, I always couch it as it's not what, how much money you have. It's the absence of money in your lives. That Th that's right. Look, this is the fundamental issue. It's affordability. It's the middle class has been squeezed for decades, and folks are, are frustrated about it. And they got a right to be. You know, and so I think strengthening the middle class is one of the things that we need to do as a country. You know, they've been, it's not an accident to me that the middle of our politics have been hollowed out while the middle of our economy has been hollowed out. And they need to show that government can work for them again. I think we can do that with things like restoring the SALT deduction that was taken away, expanding the child tax credit. Um, I think we need more affordable housing that works in conjunction with communities to lower, to increase supply and lower costs. Folks are really feeling affordability crisis at home. And, of course, there's climate change. There's a lot of concern about protecting women's reproductive freedom. Because if you're voting Republican, they're going to put back that national, national, uh, national you know, restrictions in place. So, but, but affordability is the key issue. And leaning into strengthening mm. the middle class and everything we can do to do that, that's what we need to be focused on. That's behind the fact that sleepwalking into you know, degradation of our democracy, we all got to be wide awake Absolutely. in America right now. So, so you, you're knocking on doors, yep. you're planting yard signs, shaking a lot of hands. It sounds like you've decided, uh, despite being in TV and being in media for a while, looks like you've decided that you're going to run a hardcore grassroots campaign. Got to do it. Right? Got to do it. Look, you know, this is about meeting folks where they are. It's about doing the work. You've got to earn every vote. We've got a primary first, of course. You've got to earn and earn every vote and talk to mm -hmm. folks where they are. Um, that's the way you that, that look. Democracy decisions are made by people who show up. I'm going to show up. All Democratic right. congressional candidate John Avalon. Thanks, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, uh, we John. You guys you. What's your website if people want to help out? JohnAvalon.com. I appreciate that's it. That's pretty John easy. Avalon. Set up shop Claudio's in Greenport. Oh, in the oh. great place. And then if you want to talk to the younger families, go next door to Krabby Jerry's. Krabby <laughs> Jerry's. I know that yeah. well. Greenport. Okay. Yeah. Good advice. Coming. James, back to you uh, briefly here about Nikki Haley, uh, about what she did over the last couple of months and taking on finally Donald Trump in a more frontal way, but also what we saw last night in many states, which was Nikki Haley, though she lost, only won the state of Vermont, picking up 25 percent, 30 percent, in some places 40 percent of the vote in a Republican primary of voters saying we are not going along for the ride with Donald Trump. Well, yeah, that, she got some, I wouldn't call them impressive numbers, but it really exposed Trump's weakness. And he's a lot weaker than we like to believe. And, and uh, her donors stuck with her pretty good. I, they, they put out a list that even here in Louisiana, but when it was all inevitable for sure, it was a pretty impressive group of people that came out in support of her. So, I mean, obviously she's going to recede. But the 30 percent of the people that voted for her are going to have a, it'll play a large part in this election coming up in, in November, depending on what they do. If they go, you know, stay, law, stay with Trump, that they vote for Biden, that they not vote, or they vote for a third party. I mean, these are some this key, key demographic here. It's Haley vote the 30 percent of Republicans that voted for Haley. It's going to be interesting to see where they go. Yeah. You know, James, uh, when Donald Trump was on his way to winning in 2016, you and several other uh, Democrats were concerned about the Democrats campaign. Uh, I'm curious, uh, do you have concerns about the Biden campaign, their ability to identify the voters they need to get in Wisconsin, Michigan and Pennsylvania, pull them out to the polls and beat Donald Trump in the states that matter? 
You know, Joe, I think that I know the people that are running this campaign, I find them all to be experienced. I find them almost a person to be talented. The, the problem, of course, with Biden, and we all know what it is, is he's got a, a huge issue to overcome in, in terms of his age. And I see these people getting mad at the New York Times for asking the question. Well, you, you can't answer a question until you ask it. And that's the big obstacle they got going forward. And I don't have a problem with the, with his campaign or uh, Mayor Mitch or Mike Donald or, or you know, Clinton Folks or, or, or any of these people, but th it's a pretty daunting challenge they're faced with in, in terms of get people to see Biden as offering something, you know, yeah. some energy for the next four years in the country. Yeah, you know, uh, Jen uh, O'Malley Dillon, uh, really right. great, ran an incredible campaign in 2020. Yes. I know, I know they all have to feel really good about her being there. I'm wondering, so how do you address uh, the age issue? And I'm just curious. Do you agree with people close to Biden, people who've been friends with Biden for a long time, that maybe he's been protected a little too much? Let the guy get out there. Well, I mean, uh, there's a decisions how much he gets out there have to be made by him and has to be made by people that interact with him every day and understand what the benefits and the risk are. But it's hard for me to sit here a thousand miles away we right. say, well, you should do this with him, but they are much more attuned to what he's capable of doing or, or not capable of doing. Uh, I, I thought it was telling that when he didn't do the Super Bowl interview, but, you know, to their credit, they came back and they put him on Seth Myers, which I think helped a little bit. But I don't they, they, this is a, a, a big obstacle that they're faced with and they, they have to deal with it. Right. But the good news for the Biden campaign is Trump is very weak. He, he, you, you saw the exposure he has in the Republican primaries. You're going to see more exposure with this March 25th trial coming up in New York, a much underplayed event. Yeah. And he's not the most coherent person that ever lived either. Well, I'll tell you what, we're really concerned <laughs> for his health. Uh, and he's slowing down so much and looks, uh, I mean, the energy level is just completely collapsed and uh, gets lost uh, time and time again. Sometimes it just looks like he's short circuiting. So. I think, we, I think we're all worried about the health of, of, of him. Democratic strategist James Carville, thank you so much. Uh, great to see you as always. That, that, thank you very much. And Ali Vitale, my former student, go get it, man. <laughs> there that, you that, go. That, that girl's <laughs> killing it up there, man, killing it. There you <laughs> go. She is. All right. Thank you, James.